I wrote a song to help you remember all the spatial concepts you need to know for AP Human Geography Unit 1. Absolute and relative location, space and place, flows, distance decay, time, space, compression, patterns. <laughs> it's more of a spoken word piece and you know, it's probably not going to help you. Anyway, you have to know all those for AP Human Geography, so if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well, let's get to it. Now, before we get into these six concepts you have to know, let me remind you in case you forgot what the fresh heck spatial concepts even are. Remember that spatial is a word related to space, and so it refers to the way in which different phenomena are organized in that space. For example, here's a basic outline of my studio where I'm filming this right now. But then I had my desk here, a camera here, lights, a map cabinet, the drawer where I keep all my Twizzlers. Don't tell my kids. And now you're looking at the spatial arrangement of this room, like where things are located in my space. Now, to put it mildly, geographers love analyzing spatial concepts. No, love is too weak a word. They lerf it. They loaf it. And there are six major spatial concepts in human geography that you need to know. But just a second, check out the link in the description if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. There you're going to find my AP Hug Heimler review guide, and it's the fastest, most complete way to study for any exam that you've got. It's got videos you won't see here on YouTube, practice questions, note guides, a practice exam, and answers for everything. So get your clicky finger out and have a look, and now back to spatial path. First is absolute and relative location. And let's begin with absolute location, which indicates a precise geographical location on the Earth's surface. Now, in order to understand absolute location and how it's calculated, you've got to know about two other terms, namely latitude and longitude. Latitude lines run horizontally, and sometimes you'll hear them called parallels because they run parallel to the equator here at the center. Longitude lines run vertically, and their center is called the prime meridian, which runs through Greenwich, England. And if you have trouble remembering which is which, then think of latitude like a ladder. Latitude Latitude, a ladder, you just climb right up it. Anyway, together, longitude and latitude lines form a grid that overlays the entire Earth, and these lines make it possible to determine the absolute location of any place on Earth. For example, my absolute location right here, right now, is 37.09 degrees north and minus 88.59 degrees west. And if you want to visit, then just come on down. But you probably knew that I'm lying, because that's the coordinates for the National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Kentucky. But hey, you know, if you go there, let me know how it is. Okay, moving on to relative location, which describes one location in reference to another, and it's usually measured in time or space. So we saw the absolute location of the National Quilt Museum, but its relative location to where I am in Atlanta is six hours to drive. Or look at this, Google is kind enough to tell me that if I want to walk, the relative distance is six days. <laughs> Worth it. All right, I'm kind of getting a little excited about the Quilt Museum, and if you want to take a Heimler class field trip, then spam the comments with Quilt Time. We'll see if we can make it happen. Okay, now the second spatial concept you need to know is another pair of related terms, namely space and place. Space is a more theoretical concept that geographers use to describe the geometric surface of the Earth. Think of it kind of like a super flat world in Minecraft. Like, there's nothing on it, there's no defining features, it's just space. But place, on the other hand, describes the way humans modify a particular space in ways that reflect who they are. So, for example, over the summer, your classroom was just a blank space, a dismal collection of tile floors and concrete block walls. But before the school year started, your teacher came in and made that space a place. She organized the desks and put art on the walls. And you can get the idea of place when you notice the difference between how your history teacher decorates the classroom versus your math teacher. Each room reflects the person who made it. And the same is true of whole cultures and populations of people. Okay, the third spatial concept you need to know is flow, which is a term that describes the patterns of connection between two places. Now be careful here, I said flow describes the pattern of connection between two places, not the fact that they are connected, and that is an important distinction. For example, here's a map of the Magic Kingdom at Disney World. When you enter Main Street and get to the central hub, there are five lands connected to the center. So spatially, all I'm saying here is that these five distinct lands are connected. But when geographers study flow, they're more interested in how people move between those connected lands and the patterns that characterize that movement. Like, I know because I love Disney World all the way down that the first thing in the morning, the vast majority of people are going to turn right into Tomorrowland or go up here into Fantasyland. So if you go to the park, pro tip, go left first thing in the morning. Trust me. Anyway, two places can be connected by roads or rivers, and geographers study the patterns of cars or boats that travel between them, and that is flow. Okay, now the fourth spatial pattern you need to know is the concept of distance decay, which says that the further apart two things are, the less connected they will be. In other words, all things being equal, the greater the distance between these two places, the more connection between them falls apart. So when I'm really close to the microphone, you can hear me just fine. A little further back and the signal gets a little weaker. Can you hear me back here? Not really? Well, I guess the distance is really decaying my signal. <laughs> but geographically speaking, again, all things being equal, the further apart two populations are geographically, the less connected they will be, the less sharing, the less interaction between them. That was the case for a lot of human history, but here's where I tell you that with the rapid rise of transportation technologies like railroads and then cars and then planes, and then the rise of communication technologies like the telegraph and then the telephone, and now the internet, distant places are a lot more connected than they used to be. And then the fifth spatial concept you need to know is time-space compression, which describes the decreased distance 
distance between two places measured by the time or cost it requires to travel between them. For example, in 2008, my wife and I traveled to Italy, but to get there was kind of a miserable eight-hour flight with my guy in front of me deciding to recline his chair the whole time. But truthfully, I don't have much room to complain because if we decided to visit Italy in 1759, it would have taken two whole stinking months on a ship full of nasty germs. The point is, Georgia is here and Italy is here. The same places in 2008 that they were in 1759. So the distance between the two countries has not changed, but the time and cost required to travel there has significantly decreased. So that's time-space compression, and it's a huge concept for geographers, especially as the world becomes increasingly connected through travel and politics and economics. And finally, the sixth spatial concept you need to know is patterns, and that's exactly what it sounds like. One of the main tasks of geographers is to try to describe geographic patterns, which means they try to make sense out of how phenomena are arranged on the landscape. And here are six patterns that show up again and again. First, geographical phenomena can be random, which means there is no pattern, and you might see this if you look at pet owners in a region, like there's no real order here. Second, you can have clustered patterns, which means phenomena are tightly packed together. So there's a big cluster of gas stations here where a lot of people live, and then a lot fewer out here where few people live. And that is an example of number three, dispersed patterns, which indicates that phenomena are spread out. Fourth, you'll sometimes see linear patterns, which means phenomena occur in a straight line. You might see houses along a road, or back in the old days, towns along a railroad. Fifth, you've got circular patterns, like you might see in parts of Germany where houses were built around a central communal space. And sixth, geometric patterns, in which phenomena appear in regular orderly fashion, kind of like the square and rectangle farm plots in the Midwest United States. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing for unit one, and click here to grab my AP Hug Heimler review guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.